So we're looking at the topic of conversion, which is you hear a phrase you hear people use often is someone just got converted or do you want to convert? And a lot of time we don't really know what it really means. Basically, it means becoming a Christian. But the question is, how does someone become a Christian? And this is so important because all the things we looked at so far about Jesus dying on the cross, none of them take effect in your life unless you are a Christian. So if someone doesn't become a Christian, they can't then claim that Jesus died in their place and the cross. They can't claim to be adopted into God's family. They can't be claimed, claimed to be redeemed. All these things that we've been studying, you can't claim them for yourself on the day of judgment unless you've become a Christian, unless you've converted. And some people think you become a Christian by just going to church or some people think if you were born British, you're a Christian. Or if your dad was a Christian, then you're a Christian. You know, I heard someone say once, well, we're Methodists. And I was like, who's we? Like, I'm talking to one person. I was thinking, what? she got split personalities. And she said, well, my family's all been Methodists. And my father's a Methodist. And I said, oh, what's a Methodist? She was like, well, our family are Methodists. Like, she didn't know what a Methodist was. But, so she had this impression that she was now a Christian because of a family tradition. Um, it doesn't work like that. And so we're going to look at it now, how someone does become a Christian. First question is, is it by believing who Jesus is? In other words, do you become a Christian by believing that Jesus is God, that he's the son of God, that he's the Messiah, that he's the person who died on the cross for your sins? Now, the answer is actually... Just believing that will not save you because it says in the Bible in James 2.19 it says you believe that God is one you do well even the demons believe and shudder. So James is saying that even demons have good theology <laughs> and they know that God is one. They know there's God the Father, Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit <laughs> three and they're one, one God. And the demons know this but that is not enough to save them. So whilst it is important and it's necessary for Christians to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to the earth and died and rose again three days later, that is important to know. But just knowing that on its own is not converting. It's not becoming a Christian. There's people that know this, but they will not actually convert. So next question is, is it by approving of Jesus I've met many people over the years who say, oh, it's wonderful that you're a Christian, Duncan. Really respect you for that. That's great. And Christ yeah, Jesus, Christians, everything is good, man. It's cool. And what they're doing is they're approving of Jesus. They think Jesus is good. You often hear it. Oh, he was a good teacher, you know, as if he was like Gandhi or someone like that. You know, he was a good guy. Well, that is not enough to save you because it says in John 3, 2 to 3, this is the story of Nicodemus, right? This guy called Nicodemus comes to Jesus and it says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he's bigging him up. He's like, you're good. We see you do these things. We know you've come from God. But Jesus doesn't care about man's approval. And he says to Nicodemus, he says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't come into the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Now, we're going to study that in the future about what that means to be born again. But for now, what you need to know is that just approving of Jesus isn't enough. Nicodemus, he approved of Jesus, and Jesus lets him know that that is not enough to be saved. So that leads to the question of what is necessary to be saved? What do you have to do? What do you have to think to be saved? And two things we're going to look at. The first is trust. Trust is needed. Trusting in Jesus for forgiveness of sins and eternal life and we see this in John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish 
but have eternal life. So there, where it says whoever believes in him, in the Greek, it literally says whoever believes into him. And the word for believe is the same word for trust. And I would argue that in today's language, a better word than believe is trust for our culture. The idea being whoever puts their trust into Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. So the idea here is you put your trust into Jesus. And if you think about it, most of our lives we spend trusting in ourselves, that we take care of ourselves. Even when we want to be better people, we trust ourselves to be better people. And a lot of us trust ourselves to stand before God on the day of judgment and be all right. And many people I talk to have said, I think on the day of judgment, I would be all right because God would see the good things I've done in my life. And that's trusting in yourself. In the Bible, it says you've got to put your trust into Jesus instead of in yourself, into Jesus. So it's really important to trust in Jesus, to trust him that he will take care of your sins, to trust him that from what he did on the cross, he can save you and you can live with him for eternity in heaven. That's so important. But there's a second thing that's needed, and that's repentance. And repentance means turning from sin. That's what repentance means. Sounds like an old-fashioned word, but it's quite simple what it means, really. It's just turning from sin. So let's have a look at this. In Acts 3.19, the message they preach there is, Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. And then in Acts 26, 20, it says, They should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So here it talks about repenting, which is turning from sin. And it also says, and turn to God. So the idea is, you're facing sin, you turn from your sin, and you turn to God. And when you turn to God, what you're doing is putting your trust in him and saying, I trust you now, I can't sort out my own life. I want to leave my sin, turn to you. I trust you to save me. That's, that's what it is. And notice it says performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So the idea is that after that point of conversion, you will start living a lifestyle that matches up to your commitment to turn away from sin and turn to Jesus. But here's the thing, right? When you say to Jesus, I want to turn from my sin and turn to you, we do it with the realization that we on our own cannot turn away from sin so the idea isn't and i've got to stress this because a lot of people think this the idea isn't that you say right once i've given up all these sins i've got on my list here tick them off then i'll turn to jesus the idea is you're aware of your whole list of sins and you're aware that there's many more you have even realized yet and you say i want to leave them behind jesus i can only do it in your strength i trust in you to save me so conversion is not cleaning your life up and then turn into him. It's a decision, a decision to leave your sin, turn to Jesus, knowing that only he can help you to do that. Now, this is important, right? Next point. Repentance and trust need to occur together. So I said there's two parts to conversion. There's repentance and then there's trusting in Jesus. And they've got to occur together. Here's an example. When Paul in Acts 20 verses 20 to 21, he says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And then a bit later he says, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see the two things there. He told them that they need to repent towards God and they've got to have faith in Jesus. So it's turning from sin, turning to God, and trusting in God to save you. Jesus sums up this whole thing quite nicely in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30, from the Net Bible translation. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So the first bit is, come to me. Yeah? Which he's telling people to um, believe in him to put their trust into him, okay? Then he says in verse 29, take my yoke on you and learn from me. Now the yoke in those times was a symbol of um, submission to something, to start obeying something. So Jesus is saying, start obeying me. 
and learn from me. And obviously we learn from the Bible how to obey Jesus. So here you've got the two things, to believe in Jesus, in other words, to put your trust into Jesus, but also to take his yoke on. In other words, to say, now I'm going to submit Jesus to your direction and guidance. I'm going to follow your rules. So we've got the two things there, repentance and faith. And then he says, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my load is not hard to carry. Because Jesus helps you through the whole process. So it's a wonderful thing. No matter how appealing your sin seemed before, turning to Jesus is so much better. Once you're walking with Jesus, it's much better. So to sum it up, conversion is turning from sin and turning to Jesus, trusting him to save you. That's what conversion is. So you can see it's very different to the idea of just going to church or becoming a member at a church, you know, or just saying I'm British, therefore I'm Christian. You know. Here's a diagram from Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. You've got the, the non-Christian holding on to his sin, completely turned away from Jesus, and then in repentance he turns away, and in faith he puts his trust into Jesus, and those actions there are conversion. Turning away from sin, turning to Jesus, and trusting him to save you. That's conversion. So now you see why it would never work to try and manipulate someone into getting saved. And we know that in London, there are gangs, like Muslim boys, who will put a gun to someone's head and say, well, you convert now. Now, a Christian could never use those methods because someone just saying, yeah, I'll convert, it's not a true conversion. Unless they're doing this, then they're not really converting. So it's got to be what an individual truly wants to do when they're truly doing it from their heart. But what we can do with people, if, if you've got a friend who says they want to convert, they want to become a Christian, then what you can encourage them to do is to pray to God. And these are called prayers for salvation. Now it's important to realize that prayers don't save but the attitude of the heart does. What I mean by that is not that the prayer is ineffective, but what I mean is if someone just repeats a prayer that they hear you say, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a Christian. Some people, they do it where the Christian says, Lord Jesus, and then the person next to them says, Lord Jesus, and then they say, I want to turn to you, and blah, blah, blah. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's important to realize just them mimicking you doesn't make them saved unless their heart is truly saying what their mouth is saying but what you can do when you lead someone in a prayer is just make sure that your prayers include the following things a sorrow for sin repentance should involve a sorrow for sin and you get a genuine godly sorrow sorrow for sin and you get a fake sorrow for sin and you, you'll see this at times in people's lives where they cry about their sin and they realize they're a terrible sinner but it's not godly repentance and years later you can see that they never really did become a Christian. It, it does happen. But people should have a sorrow for sin and we hope and pray that the sorrow they have is a godly sorrow. Next thing is a commitment to leave it. That's where you're turning from your sin and you say, Jesus, I realize I'm a terrible sinner. I want to turn from that and turn to you. And the other thing the prayer should consist of is a decision to put trust in Jesus. So that the person is saying, Jesus, I put my trust in you now. I'm going to trust you to save me. And I think these three things are important to have in any sinner's prayer. And this is really a, a one-time prayer you make when you want to become a Christian. But at the same time, throughout our lives, <laughs> there's times where we need to repent of our sin. And there's times where we want to make a recommitment to God and say, God, I realize I haven't been trusting in you lately. I've been trusting in myself. Because sometimes we do that as Christians. We start trusting in the good things we do. And we start thinking, yeah, I'm all right. I do some good things. And those are times to say, sorry, Lord. I turn away from my pride. And instead, I trust you to save me. That's the only reason why I can be there on judgment day, because of you. So that's what conversion is. And it leaves us with some questions to think about. First one is, have you ever expressed sorrow for your sins? And sometimes someone could be in a church for years and they might have said a sinner's prayer, 
but they might never have actually expressed sorrow over their sins. And they might not even really be sorrowful about their sins. So it's important for us to actually say to God, I am sorry for my sins. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Another question is, have you ever put your trust in Jesus to save you? Have you ever actually said, Jesus, I trust you to save me? Because of what you've done on the cross, I'm trusting you. That's really important. And that avoids the whole cultural Christian thing of thinking that because your family's Christian or because you go to church, you're saved. And the last thing is, how do you tell people to be saved? See, knowing what conversion is really helps you when you tell other people the gospel. Uh, people will say, how do I become a Christian? And you can tell them, you can say, you got to turn from your sin, you got to turn to Jesus and trust him to save you. And that's very simple, but it's important we do that. And it's important we don't just focus on one point. Like if you just say, ah, oh, just trust in Jesus, but you don't tell them to turn from their sin, you end up with someone who might not actually really be saved. Or they might be very confused about their salvation. And if you tell someone, turn from your sin, but you don't tell them to trust in Jesus, you end up with someone who the rest of their life tries very hard to not sin, but they're never believing that Jesus has paid for their sins on the cross. And they live a life of good works, trying to do good deeds, helping elderly women across the street, giving money to charity, turning up early for church, and all these things thinking they get them into heaven. And those things won't, only trusting in Jesus would. Only trusting in Jesus does. So we've got to give a balanced message to people about what conversion is. Now, here's a verse to remember. You can use this when you're talking to people about the gospel. You can say, this is what Jesus said. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me. Because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my load is not hard to carry. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for what you did on the cross for us. Thank you for your substitution, for taking our penalty in our place. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for taking God's wrath so that we won't face that. Thank you for the privileges of adoption so that we can be God's sons. Thank you for reconciling us to the Father. And we recognize, Jesus, that it's only because of what you did on the cross that we can have a relationship with God, that we can have a relationship with yourself. And we also recognize, God, that to enter into that relationship, it's important that not only do we trust you to save us, but that we also make a commitment to turn from our sins. And even though many of us here have probably done that before, God, we take another opportunity to say, Lord, we're sorry for our sins. And we want to turn from our sins, God, and we want to turn to you. We want to take your yoke, Jesus. We want to be obedient to you and submit to you. We want you to lead us. Thank you, Jesus, that your yoke isn't hard to carry. We pray that you would help us to follow you and we put our trust in you, Jesus, that because of what you did on the cross, we're saved and that we're going to live with you for eternity, not because of anything good we've done, but because of what you've done. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.